Good evening. Yeah. Um, everybody else freezing like I am? This, no, this, count, this counts as winter in Florida. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this special lecture. Um, as most of you know, over the past couple of years, we've been exploring um, the literary connections um, of surrealism, in addition to, obviously, we pay a lot of attention to the pictorial arts. Um, but we're trying to explore more of the literary connections. And last year we had our exhibition on M.A. Césaire, and now um, we're looking more deeply at the work of Paul Eluard. And to that end, um, we are very lucky to have with us tonight um, Dr. Alex Lenoble, who's going to be giving a talk, Paul Eluard, The Power of Poetry. Dr. Lenoble is an assistant professor of French in the Department of World Languages at the University of South Florida, which he joined in 2019 after completing his PhD at Cornell. At USF, he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in Francophone literature and culture, French cinema, and literary theory. His research interests include Francophone and Caribbean literature from the 20th to the 21st century. I learned something today. I looked up his work on Franck Etienne, and um, I started to give myself an education um, on Haitian literature, poetry and politics, and trauma theory. He's currently working on a book project entitled Form, Psyche, and Politics. Postcolonial Literatures Beyond Representation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alex Lenoble. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me here. I'm really happy to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, one of the favorite surrealist French poets, Paul Eloi. Um, so um, uh, last, I think it was last week, Peter Tush did a presentation about Paul Eloi, about um, his life and elements of his biography. So I won't, I hope I won't repeat, repeat too much what happened in this presentation, but I will focus mostly on the poetry. So we will look uh, closely at some poems and um, uh, in relationship to the in relationship to the political context and to the um, also to his life because you can't ignore the context uh, in the case of um, Eluard's poetry. Um, for Eluard, poetry was more than uh, sorry. For for Eluard, poetry was meant as it was for Rimbaud as a means to change life. So it was something that was a quest all his life. And um, there is an, ev an evolution of his style and his subjects throughout his life. And it's related to events that happen in his life and through historical events. So of course, yes, his um, life was not a walk in the park because uh, he went through two world war, as you probably know. And so there's the two world war that influences his poetry, but also uh, his relationships, his love affairs. Uh, well, I, I, I shouldn't say affair. He, he has three big relationships with three women that are at the center of his work. Um, the first one being Gala, uh, before she went with and get, got married with, with um, Dali and became Dali's muse. Uh, after Dala, there was um, a woman that he named Nush. Uh, and I, w I, will, I will come back to that. Uh, and then you, and then unfortunately, Nush died unexpectedly when she was only 40 years old. And that was very, that, that, that was very um, hard for him, and he 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 went into a big depression. Uh, but at the end of his life, uh, he found another, so of his third love, with Dominique. Um, so if you look, I I try to have some landmark here with the with the timeline. So it's just some. Uh, some landmarks, so the um, uh, f because because there's there there are several ways to organize or to look at uh, Eluard's poetry and and the evolution. But um, so from 
so he was born in 1895, uh, and uh, and I will look at uh, so from 1895 to 1920 as his use poetry. But already, of course, uh, he was he will be involved in um, he will be involved in the in the war. Um, so what happened during this period is that his um, his health has always been pretty fragile and he contracted tuberculosis and so was sent into a sanatorium in Switzerland and that's actually the place like in uh, where he met um, Gala in the sanatorium. So that's where they fell in love and that's where he started writing poetry. Uh, she was very encouraging to him and she became also right at the beginning is muse. So poetry comes really from love um, for Eluard, but unfortunately their, their happiness didn't last long because, of, because the World War I was declared and he was mobilized. So they had to be separated and he left, and they, but they got married during the war at, at, uh, in 1916. So I will, um, so I will talk more about so all of this period, uh, but what is uh, also important is that there are three big crises that can be read into his poetry. So in, um, in his life and, and in his poetry, so in 1924, um, there is a kind of a mysterious disappearance that happened after probably some issues with uh, Gala and Max Sands, who was involved with them at the time. But I will go back to that. And uh, so they, he just left without telling anyone where he was going, and traveled to the to Asia and the Pacific and. So we left for seven months without telling anyone, and people started to think he was dead, and then found out that actually he um, he just left and 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 was in uh, and was in Asia, uh, but he came back uh, reconciled with uh, with uh, Gala for some time, but not for long, of course, because then Dali and Gala will meet will meet. Sorry. So that's a, that's a crisis, and it's a crisis also for his poetry because that's a, a moment where he thought about to stop writing poetry. Um, it was, there is the, the temptation of silence. So it's also close to, we can think of uh, the figure of uh, Rimbaud that uh, left and just stopped writing. Writing didn't have any meaning anymore. But at the same time, he also didn't want this kind of mystification. So I, I, when he came back, he, he dismissed this travel as something like uh, stupid and just like that, that didn't have any meaning. Um, anyways, so the next big uh, event was the rupture with André Breton and surrealism. So after many years, after almost 14 years, being loyal and participating in the activities of surrealism. Uh, Eluard and Breton uh, so had a, a breakup uh, and, and they, they were friends. They have been friends for a long time and they were very close. Um, but there was also always something that uh, Eluard didn't fit in the movement of, the, of surrealism. Um, Breton calls him the, the reticent disciple. So, but this rupture, like, yeah, marked his life. And then in 1946, the death of his second wife, I, I talked a little bit about it. So, Noosh, that really was uh, disastrous for him. And again, uh, there was the temptation of silence because how can you react to such an event? What such something so unexpected and something that shouldn't happen. So 
So the first poems that he wrote, as I said, were love poems to Gala. Uh, but when the, world, when the war was declared, he didn't stop writing, but of course his topic changed, and he wrote about his relationship with war. Um, so the, is one of the first collections that was published is called Le Devoir et l'Inquiétude, which means duty and anxiety. Uh, so that was published in 1916, and that's when he chose his pen name, Paul Eluard, that he borrowed from his maternal grandmother. And, oh yes, sorry. And, and in, in, this, in this collection, you, we can see like um, an ambivalent relationship, uh, an, an ambivalent yeah, relationship between Eloi and the war. So at first, he wants to fight. He wants to fight for his country and he wants to be a soldier and do his duty. But the more time passes, the less um, involved he is also because he met anarchists and he wants to... And, 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 for, and, and a little by little, he, found that, he finds out that this war actually doesn't have any meaning and that it's meaningless and absurd and that they're fighting for values that don't represent them. Um, so instead of keeping writing on war, he, he, he writes um, his poems for peace in 1918. And so that's the first poem that we have here. And so it's... it's and these poems for peace, so it's um, already we see, so it, it is, you can, you can say like a um, poem that has been, um, that, that was written because of the circumstances, uh, but there's always this ambivalence between the circumstances and between like what Elua is uh, seeking out in his poetry. And so uh, it's, also a, it's also a love poem. It's also a poem about love. And because love is, the reason why it is possible to still have hope and to still uh, to still imagine and vision a time without war. So here, if you look at the poem, um, all the happy women have their menfolk home, such warmth as though back from the sun. He loves and says softly hi before kissing his darling. So he imagines the soldier coming back to their families and is, uh, is emphasizing the values of love and the values of family into the, in, uh, instead of, well, uh, instead of here we have fraternity, which is the value that was very emphasized during the war. And one, the thing that is maybe the most noteworthy in this poem is the last, uh, the last stanza, for a long time, I had a good for nothing face, but now I have a face to be loved, I have a face to be happy. So that, that is also like something that will be developed later in his poems. And you can see, so the face, having a face that is good for nothing, why is the face good for nothing? It's because when you are at war, um, you are confronted by an enemy that, can, that cannot recognize you as a human being. So there is no recognition of, the other and no identification possible. So that's why the face meant, means nothing in times of war. And a face for Elua, the face, so the possibility of relating to the other, the possibility of, and, and the possibility of life to have a meaning is related to the faith, to the possibility of being loved. <clears throat> After the war, after the war, the, um, so after the war, Elua uh, made some new friends. Um, so he met Breton, he met, he met uh, Aragon, and he met Philippe Soupeau. And all of them were really revolted by, so by, of course, by the war that they, 
they have been put into this situation. They had to fight for some things, for values that didn't, uh, that were not their, theirs. And, um, and they become very revolted against uh, the values of society that brought them to this situation. Um, because the value before the World War I, what was, uh, what was promoted was a kind of a bourgeois moral with a social order, and very important uh, yeah, very, uh, insistence of morality. And this became very meaningless because if these kind of values were supposed to lead to a war, then what was the point? Uh, so so it, it's for, it, for, for them. They find it very hypocriti hypocritical, and they and and because of, and and they and at the same time, um, in Switzerland there was so Tristan Zara who uh, was who already founded the Dadaist the Dada movement. So, so for for those of you who don't know what Dada is, I uh, just uh, quickly. So Dada doesn't mean anything. It's just a word that Tristan Zara opened uh, a dictionary and by chance found this word, which in French means uh, it's, it's the way a child would call a horse, or it could be also it could design um, a hobby. But it didn't mean anything for them, and that was the point. So the point was to this to turn away from meaning because there was no meaning. And it, it was a way to rebel against uh, the values of society, against the respect of language, against the respect of art and the respect of literature. So everything um, had to be destroyed. Everything had to be, uh, and had, had to be, yeah. And, and that was the, that was the, um, yeah, that that was the the way uh, it. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a, a, a really nihilist movement. So because it was so nihilist, uh, it didn't last long. And, and for most of the for most of the of the surrealists, I mean, of course, it was just a starting point because then they will turn to surrealism. But I want to just uh, stop a little bit about the. To think about what what they what did they take from the Dadaist period, and what did Eluard found out in the in the Dada movement that he could use from his own quest? Um, he didn't want to completely adhere. I mean, that's the problem with Eluard. He never completely adhered, but he he wanted to transform to create a new language and to. To change, to change the way poetry was written. And so uh, some of the techniques that, that were promoted by the Dada movement were very useful for that. So for instance, um, so the, the collage, for instance, was something that he uses uh, a lot in his first collections of poems. So the way he reuses his poem uh, that he wrote when he was young, for instance, um, and uh, also like what he tried to do is to reduce uh, the language, to reduce the complexity of the language, and to have something um, very, very um, was striking, and and to also refuse the idea of beauty in art. Uh, to not to be focused on this idea of beauty, but to create something that is spontaneous, uh, maybe that has some kind of humor in, in it, and that's that's what he wanted to create. So, um, one of the poems from this period is called is uh, extract from this collection of poems, animals, the animals and their humans. And here is is describing a spider, um, the quick spider of feet and hands of dread is here. The spider, happy with his weight, stays motionless like the lead of the plumb line, 
and when it runs away, breaking all the threads, it is pursued into the void that you must imagine all destroyed. So you can see some influence from the data, and it is from the data period, but then at the same time, it is not at all uh, similar to other data poems, because you can still understand the syntax. The syntax is pretty clear. Um, it's also like small organized poems, like each, for, each about a different animal, so the topic is recognizable. And the only thing that maybe uh, you can see that where is influenced by uh, Dada here is that the, the subject of the poem. The subject seems pretty random, and it's difficult to really find meaning out of the poem. Uh, it looks like more like something like playful. Um, so how to describe like a spider from a new perspective and how to imagine the relationship between the so humans who are scared of the spider and the spider. But still, so it's, it's uh, still, Elua is still, again, a reticent disciple here. Uh, in 1922, so he wrote repeti repetitions, so repetitions, and repetitions, so what he said about repetitions is that he just collected, collected um, leftovers from his poetry of youth and put them together in a different order. So that's how he wrote these poems, and that's how he created an, um, a new forms of poetry. And, and so he, he, he took um, bits and pieces from here and there and put them together and hoping that it would create new images and a new, the, a new, yeah, new images and transform the way we relate to reality. Well, and that's the, that's also like the, the, yeah, the collaboration with Max Ernst that is going to be quite problematic because of Gala, as we will see. So as, but in 19, uh, so the, the, the Dada movement wasn't very long, uh, didn't really last long, and uh, Breton published the Manifesto of Surrealism in 1924. Uh, this is a poem from, this is a, a painting from Max Ernst that is, so in, an imaginary part, painting about the world of the Surrealists. So the surrealism came from a desire to create a new reality that would be superior to the reality that we know because it would integrate dreams and the forces of dreams and unconscious and uh, the imaginary. Uh, so Elua was part of the surrealism from the beginning and he was genuinely collaborating with the surrealist movement from the beginning, but at the same time, uh, he didn't participate in some of the, practi uh, the practices. Um, so, for, for instance, he was not interested in automatic writing, and he was not interested in. in he, he wasn't. He didn't believe in the similarities between dream and uh, between dreams and poetry, and that was a huge point of contention between actually Bre Breton and Eluard. For Breton, dreams were primary and were the matter of the unconscious and that, that, were, that they were creation in themselves. But Eloi really thought about uh, the power of, po th that poetry was an art and that poetry was needed composition and work and that transcribing a dream wasn't going to be poetry. But what, uh, but what Eloi took out of the where they where they came together, Elua and um, Elua and uh, and surrealism. It's with the the with the subject of love and mad love. Uh, so Gala was his muse, and Gala was it was from the beginning. It wasn't 
an easy relationship. Um, Gala was difficult and was uh, the, their relationship was really passionate, but they also like they also fought a lot, and it was difficult because Gala was very independent and didn't want to and wanted to stay independent, and so to the um, so she was she 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 was having affairs outside of the marriage and. It was okay in a way for Eluar because he wanted, he, he, because they believed in marriage as an institution that was uh, restrictive and they wanted to be, to go away from that and they wanted to uh, go away from this morality. But at the same time, he had a lot of trouble with that. And so they, uh, and, and when they met Max Ernst, so that was the beginning of troubles because they, Max, Ernst and Eduard become very good friends, and Eduard really loved uh, Max Ernst. But at the same time, uh, at the same time, well, uh, sorry, not at the same time, but uh, he also fell in love with Gala. And so what happened is that they had a menage à trois for uh, almost two years, and that's what led to the to Eduard leaving uh, uh, yeah, without disappearing, without telling anybody. And so this disappearance is probably something about that he was feeling, so the, he couldn't deal anymore with these feelings of jealousy that he didn't want to have, but that still was very uh, painful for him. And so in Capital de la Douleur, we have uh, this collection of poems where he retraces you have traces about all of these episodes. Uh, and, and also, so l'amour, la poésie. So it's in Gala is the center, so capital de la douleur, l'amour, la poésie. And in, in, he, in this collection of poems, he will express his love. But sometimes we think about Eloi as the poet of love and happiness. And I think it's more complicated than that, actually. Uh, and when you look at the text and, and you start looking at it, there's something maybe um, toward light, but there's also something dark in, in these feelings and his relationship. So Capital of Pain was published in 1926. Uh, so after he came back from his travel, and so his relationship with uh, Gala at the time wasn't going very well, and they will, uh, and, and she will left him, leave him, sorry, in uh, 19. 30. So one of the poems from one of the poem from uh, from this collection, one of the most well-known poems is "The Earth is Blue, Like an Orange." The Earth is Blue Like an Orange. Or, um, maybe you you've heard about this poem. And I chose a painting from Max Ernst to uh, because I thought it was it illustrate it well, even if it is not an illustration of the poem, and it's called uh, Marriage of Heaven and Earth. So the earth is blue like an orange. Never mistake, words don't lie. They don't give you more to sing. It's the turn of kisses to get along, fools and loves. She, her wedding ring, mouth, mouth, all the secrets, all the smiles, and what clothes of indulgence to believe her naked. Wasps bloom green. The down passes around the neck, a necklace of windows, wings cover the leaves. You have all the solar joys, all the sun on earth, on the path of your beauty. Of course, you, uh, so, so the translation, you miss, um, the, you miss the sonority and the, the fluidity of Edouard po uh, Edouard's poetry that, that you can hear when you read it in, in the French language. But what, of course, like everyone remember this poem for is, is metaphor, the earth is blue like an orange. So this is like typical of a surrealist image in a way, but it's also, it's also as a kind of logic behind him because he's associating a color, the color of the earth with something like the orange, the, the roundness of the orange. And so that's how the association works, but it's not describing something real. It's actually 
creating a new reality. So when you say never mistakes, never a mistake, words don't lie, they don't give you more to sing. What, what he means by that probably is that, is that it's not that words, words cannot, describe the, cannot describe the real, words say something else, something that is more than the real. Um, and they don't give you more to sing, so it's not a representation of the, of the real, of reality. It's not, it's something else. Uh, it's, uh, it becomes something else. And one of, probably, yeah, one of my favorite poem of Paul Eluard also is the, the Curve of Your Eyes. And here, um, it's a painting from Juan Miro. Again, it's not an illustration, but I think it works well with it. So the curve of your eyes embraces my art, a ring of sweetness and dance, hollow of time, sure nocturnal cradle. And if I no longer know all I have lived through, it's that your eyes have not always been mine. Leaves of day and moss of dew, reeds of breeze, smiles profound, wings covering the world of flight, boats charged with sky and sea, hunters of sound and sources of color, Perfume enclosed by a covey of downs that beds forever on the straw of stars. As the day depends on innocence, the whole world depends on your pure eyes, and all my blood flows under their sight. The, this poem is a. So it, it's a. It's a so it, it, it's like it's like so so it's always like the case with also Elua, like he takes some some inspiration from tradition and then uh, put it in a modern way. So here you have something that uh, resembles the genre of the blason, where you choose like a part of the woman body usually, and then you write a poem about it. So here it's the eye and the curve of your eyes. But what is very uh, also typical about this poem is how. It is completely, and first of all, it is visual. Um, it is about the shape of the eyes, so the shape like, like an almond. And that's really the shape, this form, that is that, or around which the poem is going to be constructed. So if you look at the poem, you said, so there's the, the curve. So embraces here in the French, it would be it will be something more like circles, so they, they, the, the image of the circle that's in the iris of the eyes is everywhere. The ring of sweetness and dance, the halo of time. And the cradle is like the, so the cradle, uh, re, you, you think of the, of the almond shape of the cradle. Um, and, and again, here when you see, here lives the, Reads of breeze, you think about the eyeline, the eyelashes here that are compared to reads of breeze, so to a, an element, to a natural element, the wings covering the world of light, of course, I, are the eyelids, and the boats again charged with sky and sea. The boats again are these almond shaped eyes that reflect the sky and the sea. Um, so, so the shape, this the shape of the eyes. So the geometrical shape. So that's why I think it's very similar to how uh, the surrealist painters were were painting at the time, or someone like Picasso later, uh, with like you take a shape and and then you construct like a new reality or in around it, around it. And here, um, so if you look. Um, from, from this shape, so from these eyes, and the eyes is a motif that is very important in surrealism, of course, um, because it's, the, it's, it's something very mysterious, the, the idea that you can like, see and be in a relationship with another one by looking at them, by looking at their face, and, and you, look, you, can look at, it's the, you can look at their eyes and their like, eyes look at you. 
uh, and so that this is there is all this thematic in the poem, uh, but also the woman here. As you can see, the woman is also the creature, or the she really gives life to the poet. Um, the whole world depends on your pure eyes, and all my blood flows under their sight. The woman is creating the world, and the woman is creating the poet. Uh, we know that it's Gala, the, the muse, and that he refers to Gala, but she's never named. So it, there is a, a kind of universalization and mystification of the figure of the woman who becomes almost religious. I mean, she uh, here creates the whole world. And without love, without the woman, Eluard wouldn't be able to exist, and the world wouldn't exist either, because at least the world he can, uh, he can perceive. Um, so that's, a, that's a, yeah, one of his very well-known poems, too. The lover. She's standing on my lids, and her hair is in my hair. She has the color of my eyes, she has the body of my hand. In my shed, she's engulfed as a stone against the sky. She will never close her eyes, and she does not let me sleep. And her dreams in the bright day make the suns evaporate, and me laugh, cry, and laugh. Speak when I have nothing to say. And here, uh, this is a painting from Mag Magritte, The False Mirror. And I think The False Mirror is a, is a good way to, uh, so here, you, it's, it's a love poem, but here you can see there is already some anxiety that is coming from this relationship. When even the first, the first, um, the first line, she's standing on my lids. So you can imagine several things. It's, Someone who comes out from the dream of the poet. So she comes out from, he has his eyes closed, and she comes from the dream, and she's standing on my lids. But at the same time, it's not, you can imagine, it's not very comfortable to have someone standing on your lids. And so um, it's already something that is a little bit weird. And um, then there is this idea of fusion that is coming together, so her hair is in my hair, so there is no distinction between the poet and the woman uh, and, his, uh, and his love object. Um, she has the body of my hand, so, so we can wonder, we, I, I wonder here if, is he referring to someone real or is he someone, is he just a pure creation of his dreams, of his imagination, um, is there really a re is the relationship between the two real? Um, and she will never close her eyes, and she does not let me sleep. So we can see also it, it becomes an obsession. And maybe the real woman is going away because the obsession and the imagination, uh, the creation of, of this figure is taking over. So that's also the paradoxical power of poetry. Uh, it's poetry gives meaning to love, and love gives meaning to poetry, but at the same time, it, re it, it creates also like a, a distance um, from, the, from the reality of the situation. But maybe this distance is also necessary because the real situation, the situation in reality, is not going so well at the moment with Gala. So it's, it's also the expression of that that is going on here. And one last poem from the from this, from this uh, collection is Max Ernst. So this poem is, is more enigmatic and more difficult to understand. Uh, and you can't really get it. It's like kind of a, an enigma. And you, kind of, you have to know more about the context to see what's going on here. Uh, so it, here, and, and so it, it's a poem about Max Ernst. So of course, you will have some conflicted emotions going on because that's the right the period when they are sharing gala and 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 
and Elua is really a struggle with this, with these feelings and these emotions, with dealing with that. So, um, when he talks about, in one corner, agile incest turns around the virginity of a little dress. So actually, it's Gala who is dancing for both of them, and he talks, he talks about incest because he's looking at Max Ernst, who's looking at Gala dancing, but he's also his friend. And so the incest here is something that is. So it's not a literal incest, but it's, it has something incestuous. And um, it was something that the surrealists actually appreciated. I mean, they, because it was against um, the moral values of society. So it's positive in a way, but at the same time, there is something wrong going on here. And uh, the, um, the question of, like, in one corner, bright with all the eyes, one awaits the fish of anguish. So this, this figure is also very well known. It's, it's difficult to explain, but it's easy to understand in a way. Um, it's, you understand that, that, yeah, that the, the anxiety that is described here, but also that, that comes the, with the, the fluidity of a fish and that one awaits. And, why, and, and what that refers to can be referring to, so a game that was played by uh, children where in corners, and then, so it can seem innocent, but at the same time, it uh, it's also like the the players um, so change positions and permute, and so it probably refers to who is going to be with Gala at what moment, and if Gala choose to be with one or the other, the other one will feel so this and will await the fish of anguish and feel this anxiety of being left, o left over. So this is, uh, this is the kind of, of feelings that are going on in this, in this collection. Um, but at the same time, Eluard is, um, is very committed to his love for Gala. And so he doesn't let this ruin completely the relationship. And even when they separated at the end, they will remain in contact and they will remain friends, and probably more than that. So we can go through the, the next figure, Nush, the lightness of love. Uh, um, so at this time, they, they are separated, uh, they are separated, and because Gala met Dali, and so now Gala and Dali are together. And a um, little bit afterwards, Eloi met Nush. But it was not easy for him because it was like it was something that has, it, he has to rethought the whole way of thinking and seeing the world and, and giving meaning because for him, love was something absolute and it has to be related to one object. And so it was very disturbing for him to, for this love to be over and for a new one to start. And again, so there is this temptation of silence because how can he keep writing poetry if the object, his object of love is no longer with him, if his muse is no longer here. So it's little by little and through the encounter with Nush, that he will be able to overcome this. Um, and Nush is completely the, com complete, the complete opposite of Gala. The, if, if the love that Elua had for Gala was passionate and sometimes even maybe violent, here we have uh, here this, this is a love that will be very secure. And that will be very light. Um, the sentiments apparent, the lightness of approach, the traces of caresses. Um, also, also a kind of love that is very erotic. And um, without worry of suspicion, your eyes confide in what they see, seen by what they gaze at. Look, you see that there, there is not this uh, this motif of of being uh, of being uh, uh, imprisoned. It's it's not it's not it's not that much here anymore. 
Though there are some poems about Nush that resembles the poem about Gala, but at the same time, there's also an evolution. And you can see uh, in this poem, he used way more the pronoun we also, that he didn't use so much with Gala. And with Gala, it was always the two and, uh, and L, but they start to, to change. So his vision of love and his vision of, um, his vision of yeah, an, another kind of love. And so I, I, and I think that also something that allowed him to um, turn towards other endeavors in his poetry. But so this is a, one of the collection that Elua wrote with, uh, in collaboration with Man Ray. Man Ray, who took pictures of Nush. And you would think that Elua wouldn't find himself in the same situation that he was with Max Ernst. But actually, uh, actually Nush was Man Ray's model. And so, uh, and, 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 and they probably also, it, it looks like they, they might have also, they might have had like a sexual relationship too. Um, and so it's, uh, it's interesting that he is, is in the same situation, but it seems like he is more at peace with it at this time. Um, well, uh, and, and, and that there is like really this triangular relationship going on even in the work here, because we, you have the picture taken by, uh, by Man Ray and the text by Paul Elua, and then you have uh, so they all participate in the creation of this of this book, and 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 the, the and no, she's also important. I mean, it's not she's not just passive into it, in in this. She's also willing to uh, participate and to participate in the creation of this work of art. And it's a uh, it's um, it's something that she she exposed exposes herself to, and so the the relationship between the three is. Uh, is also interesting, and uh, and one of the poems from this collection is called "Easy," easy and beautiful under your eyelids, as the meeting of pleasure dance and the rest. I spoke the favor, the best reason for fire that you might be pale and luminous, a thousand fruitful pauses, a thousand ravaged embraces, repeated move to erase themselves. You grow dark, you unveil yourself, yourself, sorry, a mask you control it. It deeply resembles you, and you seem nothing but lovelier naked, naked in shadow and dazzlingly naked, like a sky shivering with flashes of lightning. You reveal yourself to you, to reveal yourself to others. Uh, here, here again, you have the influence of the of a traditional form of poetry. That's the emblem when where you comment on a on a picture, and that's what uh, on a on a drawing, and then you write a, a poem about that, and that's so that there is a relationship with that. But it's also, um, as you can as you can see, the poem so he described so the the really the the way uh, Nush models and is naked, and and so there's this obsession about nakedness, but it's it's uh, it's uh, this uh, complicated feelings about thinking about someone looking at the, your, at the woman you love and looking maybe in an erotic way. So it's a very erotic, a group of very erotic poems and um, it's called easy and, and often uh, it is interpreted as because um, Eloir in, in, um, in other places talk about easiness as like something that is part, or, or we talk about something that is part of his uh, poetic style. Like it's easy, it's accessible, it's understandable. And he said, uh, like, beauty comes easy to me. Uh, and, and so that's, that's something. Uh, but also, there is probably also a reference to the, like, the thinking about Nush as an easy woman and a, a woman you share. And this is confirmed by the next title of his collection that will be called The Public Rose. But, so there's the, this old tension and, and all of this is creating the, the work of art. <clears throat> so I think, 
Okay, I think I, yeah, I don't have much time to finish, but I will, so I will, ah, that's, uh, yeah, I will just say, so a few words about, not a lot, but about the resistance and, and um, Peter already talked about that, about, so, uh, about the poem, this poem, um, Liberté. So, Liberty. Uh, so, this is the poem that actually made Eloi famous. And because it was, it has been parachuted during the resistance by, uh, by, by the, uh, to, to the, to the people in, in, uh, in the occupied, in occupied France. And so, this is the way, this is really like the time when poetry becomes also a tool for resistance during the war, during the Second World War. And what's interesting also about this poem is actually, so you see, so it's, it's all a, a repetition about I write your name. So on every page is red on all the white sheets, stone, blue, paper of ash, I write your name. So it's a repetition of several stanza repeating um, every possible places where I write your name. But what's interesting about this is that before being, uh, before the conclusion, so now it's, it's called Liberty, but it's a, it was actually a poem that was written for Nush. And after they had a fight and he, during the night, and at night he wrote a poem for her and read it in the morning. And then, because of friends that look to him, so it, it changed to liberty. So it's 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 all it's also like a way that love and liberty and resistance are always intermingled, and it's not possible to to uh, distinguish them from each other. Well, so yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time, uh, too much of your time, but. Uh, so, but Nush, did, but this is one of the, also the, maybe the most beautiful uh, poem that was written, and it was written just at the death, when, just after the death of Nush. So, 28 November 1946, we shall not roll together. This is one day too many, time overflows. My love so light now weighs agony. I see the, the way the, the, Time itself is completely disrupted by the death of Nush and this very brief poem and this uh, expression that we shall not grow all together, that is something that is also very, very famous and that everyone knows. So it's, it's a time of grief for Elua and, he, and his poetry is, he used poetry or he, write, he writes poetry to grieve and to, is it, is it um, does it help him to heal? I don't know, it's uh, because it's also a way to remain into this fantasy of the woman he loved is still alive. But, uh, but, the, but the, yeah, but then I want, I want to finish with this, with the, the phoenix, which is the last collection of poems uh, that was published by Elua. And so it was unexpected, but he actually find, found love again. Uh, and with, after, the, the, after the death of Nosh. And, and here, so you have, you have this, this poem again. And so it's always like, because he, he found love again, so it, this poem is really about the meaninglessness of poetry and writing until there is someone for whom you can write. Um, so in the end, it's also the, well, be, the, the, the silence is here and the meaninglessness of language and, and talking and keeping on writing. But then because she comes, because Dominique uh, is going to be part of her of his life now. Um, he is reborn, and his poetry is reborn too. So it's a victory for poetry and for um, and for him, and and it's the possibility of being reborn and, and happiness to overcome uh, periods of grief and periods of grief and death. And that is it. So I 
wanted to finish with the portrait of Paul Eluard by Salvador Dali. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, so what was going on at the time was mostly like political disagreement. Uh, they were both in the Communist Party and one became Trotskyist and the other was Stalinist. And I think so the political uh, yeah, disagreements really was probably what motivated the, the, the break at the time. But, but Breton broke up with like everyone. <laughs> he, he, Keeps the, like yeah that that was what was going on at the time also in the surrealist movement like members of the surrealist movement were part of it and then for a reason or another they were, they were not going to be part of it anymore. Yes. Were Eluard's um, war experiences a big part of his post-war writing or life? 